everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. I really appreciate you guys taking the time for the, the first uh, Coaching Legend Night at the Telegram. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice that we have this opportunity to talk to some of the greatest uh, guys I've had. And the honor of being associated with my, my position as a sports editor at the Tele Telegram is that uh, my name is Jim Wilson. Uh, thanks to the Railers for hosting this night. Uh, later on this week, this whole thing will be available online as a video form, so you guys can check it out on telegram.com. Uh, want to introduce our coaches. I'm not really much of a speaker, so I want to see this stuff. Rich Gardner, as soon as they can. Uh, but well, yeah, we have Emil Johnson, former uh, baseball coach, soccer coach at Lemister High. Uh, he retired in 2013 after 43 seasons as a Lemister High baseball coach. He did so with a resume that included a state record 725 wins and three Division I state championships. He remains one of the only, one of only two coaches in the 700 club. In addition, Johnson coached boys and girls soccer with Blue Devils, winning 485 games and two state titles over 38 years. Johnson won over 1,300 high school sports games in his career, which is on the survey of accomplishment. Uh, we have Northridge coach Ken Marshall, a football coach, uh, as a serve. After serving as an assistant for six seasons at Northridge High, Washington Hall took over as head coach at Belmont in 1976. This position he continues to hold today. And during this season, his 44th at the helm of the Rams, Washington Hall had won a state record 362 games, including the Division V state title in 2015 and eight Super Finally, we have St. John Boys basketball coach Bob Foley, who's been a coaching constant on the Central Mass Boys basketball team since 1963. Foley's poised to enter his 40th season at St. John's High. His teams, which include Upsbridge and St. Peter Marion, have won 924 games, making Foley the winningest coach in New England history. And that total includes a pair of Division I state championships. So, without further ado, this is time. So I'm just going to start real quick and say this is this has always been kind of a uh, quote unquote pet project of mine. Um, and it took a little while to not pull it together from these people's end. They they all agreed each time I asked them right out of the gate. Um, everyone was on board with it, but just to get the timing to right from my end, um, I just think it's fascinating. I grew up in Central Mass, uh, lived in uh, close to ten towns in Central Mass over the course of my life, and. Uh, Love the area, and I think it's fascinating that you can basically draw a line from Lemonster through Shrewsbury and down into Northridge, and you have um, the winningest basketball coach, the winningest football coach in state history, and one of Emil's now number two in the list, but when he retired, number one. And uh, and also we, we add the soccer into it, and uh, I just think it's fascinating from that end, and uh, it's something probably none of us will ever see again, and I doubt anyone will ever see that you'll have the winningest coaches in the state all in the same region living 30 miles from each other, essentially. So again, I'm a history buff, and that's why I wanted to do this, and I appreciate you all coming out and, uh, and making this um, add into the evening, because this originally was gonna be a kind of a kitchen table conversation on my ends, and uh, I'm glad we to expand it live and, and add the video and whatnot, so you know, this all may get shared with, with tens of thousands of people via social media, which I'm not on too much, but a lot of people are involved. Um, so I'm gonna start, just start off with, uh, can get the mic first, and it's a question for everybody. And kind of basic of uh, what made you want to get into coaching? Well, before I start, I think I should be sitting on a lower chair because I only have 362 wins, and these guys pale in comparison. <laughs> uh, what made you get into coaching? Get into coaching? <laughs> it's a funny story, and I've told it to my kids many a time. I was going to a parochial school in grade seven, and uh, and I wanted to go to the junior high because they didn't have any sports with St. Peter's. And uh, so my father finally allowed me to go to junior high so I could play sports, which is one thing I was good at because I wasn't good in school at that point in time. And, uh, and when I got there, I had my first experience with organized physical education. And I had a very special person in my life at that point in time, it's Vic Savizzi, who has since passed away. He was a great guy. And after having him for one month, I said, this is what I want to do. Because he was a coach and he was a phys ed teacher. And, and uh, from the seventh grade on, I knew what I wanted to do. So it was just something in my life that kept progressing. And, and uh, of course, football was big in my life, even though I played all three. And uh, when, we got out, when I got out of UMass, uh, just the idea of being a teacher, coach, 
was all I ever wanted to be. And, and it started way back in seventh grade. Uh, just one person, just the way he presented himself is the way I wanted to present myself. Well, mine sat a little different. Uh, my dad was a very good, <coughs> excuse me, an athlete. He went to Fitchburg State. So when I started growing up, we started with our baseball and went on to there. And I went to the same college that he went to, and uh, he became a principal. I was a teacher for 38 years at Lomas High School. And at uh, that time, I started with the soccer team which was really fighting a tough battle at that time, because if anyone knows anything about Lummerster and Lummerster Athletics, it's that their football team is always very, very good, unless they play St. John's, of course. <laughs> but uh, they allowed us to start a <clears throat> soccer program in the fall, and for kids, I had to promise that they would never <clears throat> Uh, I would never try to steal anyone that played football to come out for soccer. And it worked out well. I laughed at the time was Ted Danko, a very good friend of mine, a great man who no longer is with us. Uh, from there, uh, we started the program, and I did it for 38 years. And in that time, we won a couple of state championships along the way, and many, many kids went on to play in college. Baseball was a little bit different. Uh, when I became a JV coach, my uncle happened to be the head coach at the time, and he retired, and I took over as the head coach. And uh, baseball in Lemister is very, very important if people know athletics in the area. And uh, we started as a JV coach, and I moved up to the varsity, and in the four, uh, 43 years that we had baseball, I was watching enough to never have a losing season in the 43 years. And you don't do that because you walk on water. You do it because you've got kids that love the game and excel in the game and are happy to play the game. I played three sports in high school, and so I loved sports right from go. Uh, and I really enjoy the kids that play sports. Uh, I was at Holy Cross as a senior, and I was all set to go. I was going to be a JV coach down at Rogers High in Newport, Rhode Island. And I had a friend that was in the seminary, and he was in there with another guy, and the other guy's father I happened to be the superintendent of schools at Uxbridge. And so, I got the call and said, would you like to coach Uxbridge? I said, oh, gee, I don't know anything about it. He said, well, they're 0-20. <laughs> so you got your work cut out. So for all those people that say, oh, you're like St. John's, you get these good players, I started out with an 0-20 team. But they told me, don't worry, coach. We win all the fights. We get in a fight every game we play. <laughs> And we take on the stands and whatever. Things. Whoa, 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 whoa. That is going to stop. And so I went down there, and uh, that was the beginning back in 1963. Uh, I don't know whether they would rehire me because I only won a couple games that year, but as I remember it, I beat Northbridge High. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all people in Luxbridge care about. They don't care about anything else. You beat Northbridge, hey, we'll hire you for another year. <laughs> so that's how I started. So, curious, it's, again, it's kind of a question for all you guys. But everyone say, Emil, you're from Lemonster, you taught in Lemonster, okay, Northbridge, Northbridge. And I know you lived in Uxbridge for quite a while, like right there on the border. And Bobby well, Worcester guy, you know, getting out of college, came back to Worcester pretty quickly, and spent, you know, Shrewsbury slash Worcester. And just what made you want to stay here instead of going off somewhere else or moving to Boston or a different state to coach? Why did you make roots here? Where did you grew up? Well, I can start it off, I guess. Uh, I was raised in a 12 family tenement on Main Street in Worcester, about a mile up the street. And 
I've been in Worcester all my life. I love Worcester, love the people of Worcester. I've uh, stayed with high school. Some people say, why didn't you go on to college? High school kids listen to you and they do what you want. And I don't think I could have ever done the recruiting going out and, you know, going after the parents and the kids and making promises and all that. So any kid that plays for me has never had a promise or whatever. So I, I guess I've always loved Worcester. I still do, and I have no reason to ever move anywhere else. Like Bobby said, uh, I grew up in Lemonster, born and raised in Lemonster. My dad was a school teacher and then became a principal of a trade school. Uh, so education was important and athletics was important. And uh, as we grew up, we started playing Bay Booth. As a matter of fact, the first year Bay Booth was founded and started playing in Lemonster was 1952. And I was 15 years of age. I'm giving my age away. <laughs> but, uh, and we went on to win the state championship, believe it or not, uh, from that thing. Uh, athletics was of major importance, but education was also. And if you can blend both of those in, you can have a great career no matter where you go. And my dad, being an educator, if I didn't get good marks, I didn't play ball. If I studied and got decent marks, not, you don't have to be dean's list, but just give your very best when you play. And that uh, transpired into going to Fitchburg State, where I was watching to play uh, soccer, basketball, and baseball, and then on the Cape, I played in the summer. For, uh, young for four years. And uh, that got my career started. And when I started first year teaching, it was in Lancaster. And then the second year, I moved to Lemonstown. My dad had a little uh, influence anyway. And I needed an industrial arts teacher, which I had majored in college. And uh, I became an industrial arts teacher at the uh, junior high school, even though it's, uh, it's connected with the high school, but it was in the junior highs. Uh, from there, we went on. Became assistant uh, baseball and then the head baseball coach. And it uh, was very enjoyable. I'm, a, I'm not the easiest person to be able to uh, play for. I'm demanding, but I'm fair. And the kids appreciated that, and we had great teams over the years because they were able to take discipline, but also had great athletic ability. It's always a good question why you stay where you are. And uh, again, uh, my family's heard this story before, but uh, when I graduated from Northbridge, I applied to two schools, and it was uh, University of Miami, and it was UMass. And uh, I said, oh boy, I'm this 18 year old. UMass is too close to me, I need to get away. And uh, my mother and father were just hardworking people, and I knew they had to go out of their way to allow me to go down there. And, uh, I, and I got my first lesson as to, and I realized it later on, why I stayed in Northridge all these years. They would take me to the airport, and then I was on my own, and they were driving me into the airport, and they had to pull over on the side of the road so I could vomit. <laughs> and, and, and it sounds crazy, but what it meant was, I didn't want to go anywhere. And, uh, but I do know how hard they worked to get me to that point. And I lasted one semester, but I did finish. I did get a great point average, and I came back and I ended up at UMass. But it was that moment in time that I thought I was going to go off and see the world, and I realized I was quite happy back there in Northbridge. And then after graduating from school, UMass, and being offered the job at Northbridge, uh, you know, I realized, wait a minute, I'm nothing but a homeboy. I'm very fortunate. Uh, I have 20 grandkids, and they all live within four miles of me. So I, I guess maybe the whole family has that same attitude. If they learn, learn one thing from me, I guess, is home is a nice place to be. So being at Northbridge has been very pleasant. Uh, I've enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, my kids play for me at Northbridge. My grandkids are playing for me right now. And uh, we feel that we have a, a good 
high school football play coming in Northbridge on a regular basis. And uh, obviously doing a little bit of winning helps this whole cause, but uh, I want, wouldn't want to be anywhere but at Northbridge. So curious, I'm not very good at math because I know my short suit, but um, I know that it's been very <coughs> few losing seasons combined for all you guys. And, uh, you know, basketball, soccer, baseball, football, Kenny's three, Bob won at St. John's in 39 years, and he will never in baseball, and maybe a couple in soccer. But just um, dig a little deeper. Obviously, talents have a ton of things to do with it, and, and youth systems and that type of thing. But just what's to you? What? How does that continuity develop from your ends? Um, and it's kind of an open-ended question, but it's I'm sure your coaching style will evolve over time with that as well to try to learn things from the past to keep the continuity going. I had a good mentor when I started, it was Joey Jackman, and there might be a few people who remember, might remember that name. And uh, he went to Northbridge, and, and I worked under him for six years. And uh, he, he had this approach, he was a center when he was in high school, uh, but yet he, he loved to throw the football. And that's how it started, and I really took to that early on, uh, you know, that, that approach to it. Um, Again, give me the specific, what are you, I'm running a blank here. I think you said you got three losing seasons? Yeah, it's three. Oh, yeah, yeah just, I'm sorry. But in terms of just the, the continuity, well, I think, kind of continuity. I think one of the things, the most important things that uh, I've experienced over the years has been in my assistant coaches. Uh, now, I know in the sports that these, these two guys, gentlemen, uh, coach, uh, you might have one, you might have two. And there are times I have eight assistant coaches throughout our whole program. And I think the key has been uh, the consistency with my assistant coaches. I sure do not do this alone. Uh, and, uh, and so many of the coaches who coach them also played for me. And the other thing we have done here at Northridge for the last 35 years is we have run a flag football program on Saturday mornings. And uh, the key to that program that we have run all these years is that my players coach them. I have one or two coaches and my staff would direct it. And that has just built up over the years. And we've got it to the point, I'm sure it happens with Nemo and with Bobby, that there are kids in that, in that town, in that school, who want to play for the program. I'm not saying it's playing for me, but playing for the program. But the consistency in the program comes because you're there. Uh, you, there are people who know so much more about football than I do but they know what they're gonna get from me and they know what they're gonna get from the center. So if there's one thing that we have done is try to be as consistent as possible and it seemed to have worked in that town. That's very true. Consistency uh, for yourself and the way you treat your kids that are out for the team. You make it enjoyable, but they work their fannies off. And when they go home at the end of the day, they feel like they've accomplished something. And that's probably the biggest goal we want to have. Any kid that goes home and is, is not happy, then you haven't done your job. As far as I'm concerned, when people are happy, everyone's happy. And when they're not, there's problems. I think uh, the big reason for our continuity is sitting right there, I can't see him because the lights are in my eyes. Okay, I got my son, Bobby, who's been the JV coach, and we were just talking about it earlier. He has won 494 JV games. And people talk 200 wins, 300 wins. That's a heck of a lot of wins. So before I do anything, I ask him. The side of him is Mike Curran, and he's my freshman coach and we don't do anything unless the three of us discuss it, discuss it rather, and the head coach is between them, I believe, and that's my wife, so anytime I start getting rambunctious with new ideas and whatever, the two of them will look at me and say, remember what got you here, keep doing what you did, so. I'm curious, this is a follow-up to that. This is kind of an individual question for each of you. Um, Bob, you have a, you know, you use a, a kind of rotational system, a, you know, a bench and people 
go in on predetermined times in and out of the game, whether they they got the hottest hand in the world or the coldest, but they're out there. And just curious, I've seen it over the years, I just never asked you how you developed it. Yeah, I've done this for many years now, and people watch our games, and all of a sudden we'll watch a kid near the end of the bench get up and just go into the game. <laughs> it's like, the coach didn't send him in. What's he doing? And I've worked on a time basis for so many years that based on practice and on games, what the person has done before that, I sit down before a game, it takes me an hour and a half, two hours to figure out who's gonna play and when. And so you might be a starter, you're gonna play in the first half 24, uh, not in the whole game, 24 out of 32 minutes. You're a sub and you work like heck and whatever, and so I figure each half you're gonna play six minutes. And so I go on right through the thing and that's what I want to do at the end. And people say to me, what happens if a guy is hot out there? You know, and all of a sudden you just take him out of the game. And I look at it this way, a lot of coaches sub when a guy is fouling up out there. So if a guy has missed some shots or whatever, and you take him out there, he's sitting there mumbling and grumbling and saying, what did he take me out? And he's thinking bad thoughts. If my kid just put three in a row in and I take him out, he's thinking he's pretty good and he's enjoying that. So I think that's cool why now you put him back, he's just as confident he's gonna put in that next shot. And uh, that's how I've kind of done it over the years. Uh, if you ever see me during a game, I am ripping if one of my kids gets fouls. Because if you get fouls, you foul up my <laughs> rotation. So you better not foul anyone. And that's the only time you'll see me get a little excited on the bench and turn to him and say, what are you doing? Why'd you foul? And he knows why I'm saying it to him. So that's my continuity thing or whatever. So you know, I'm curious for you, the question is, um, you started the girls' soccer program at Lemonster in 1988. And uh, I think obviously started the boys' program in 66. And in both cases, it, you know, the 66 team was definitely ahead of the curve of the soccer around here. And, even in 88, it was still, you know, that was on the beginning of the, the upswing we're seeing today. And what led you to start a girl, help start a girls team in 88? And what was it like? Was coaching girls different than coaching boys? Well, I'll tell you, uh, the last question you asked, uh, not really. I mean, if, if, if you coach the way you're supposed to coach, <coughs> uh, Highs and lows, girls will respond to no matter how you you address the situation. Uh, going back to the first question, on our first <coughs> soccer team that we had, the first three years, we had a young girl that came out for the team. She turned out to be one of my cap tri captains for senior year. She worked out with, all by herself. When she was a senior, there was another girl because we didn't have a girls' program. But in the back of my mind, I knew there was a need to have a girls' program. And so when the time came right and there was a number of years, I then started a girls' program in which the first time we had 17 girls out for the team. And most of them weren't players, but they worked hard, they worked hard in great condition, and they did very well for themselves. And that was the start of a, a program that still exists. And, and Ken, for you, it's something you touched on earlier. We've spoken about this privately before, but um, the first time I saw a Northridge High game was probably around 1992, maybe. And I walked in there, and the balls were being thrown all over the place. I'm seeing these crazy alignment plays, all these different things. And I'm like, nobody does that. It, you know, the shoulder and the wishbone when I was in high school. And now there's you know, people, it's a run, run off as football in Central Mass, in much of the state. Why take the risk of passing? <laughs> because people will tell you bad things will happen. It's better to run the ball. 
Well, that's a, an old time philosophy. <laughs> and if you, if you watch football right now from college and, and the pros and even high school, uh, path, passing is prevalent. This all started with Joe Jackman. It wasn't really me. Joe had this passing fancy back then, and, and I just fed into that, and it's just what I love to do. I love to coach from sideline to sideline, from end zone to end zone. And the way to do that is to spread everybody out. And now everybody is doing it. Not that I started that, but I'm not even trying to say that. But uh, one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to develop a reputation of being predictably unpredictable. And, uh, and that was in my head early on. And, and I have found that when we, and we have one practice day where we call special plays. And it's been this way for years and we practice them. And then people call them trick plays, I don't. They're special plays and um, they're not trick, they're part of what we do. And there's a time and place for all of these plays. And in my mind, I know when I want, would like to call any one of these particular plays. But the funny thing is, it has to be working only because when I have watched the intramurals that we talked, I talked about earlier, and what are they doing? They're running reverse passes, they're running hitch and pitches, and they're doing a lot of what we were teaching them, and they're passing that down. So we have developed a reputation of, you know, if you're going to play against us, you better be prepared for everything we can do. And I just think it, it adds fun to our practices. So I'm going to keep with this uh, half moon approach here, I guess. And, uh, so 2013, right, I'm sorry, you made it to the state semifinals in the Super Bowl, or the state championship game. In 2014, you made it to the state final. In 2015, um, Wilcard, you coached the Rams to the state title. After that build up to that last year, what was it like at Gillette Stadium to, uh, to, to see those kids celebrate a state title on the turf of the Patriots play? Uh, it was a sense of relief uh, because that team, as a core, it was such an outstanding group as a sophomore. They were our core from sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And there was, again, a sense of relief. There was that feeling. Uh, we were developing a reputation of not being able to win the big game. And, uh, and having won that, it, it was just such an outstanding feeling. And, and I'm sure, uh, Emil and Bobby, when you get to the pinnacle and you win that game, uh, those kids will talk about those things for years. And prior to that, in football, it was just winning a bowl game. And, and there was a lot of pride in winning our Central Mass Bowl game, Central West, whatever. But having the state title, uh, it, it really, really was special. I mean, I know Central Mass football has tried for years to get to that point, and it's been a long time coming, and I think it's like about seventh or eighth or ninth year of having a, a um, state champion, and uh, it's a feeling that uh, uh, they still talk about it, and I know, I know they're gonna talk about this for 20 years, so. And having played the game at Gillette, uh, it made it that more special. Yeah, I'm gonna go quick. I'm, I didn't do research on this, I apologize, but remember, excuse me, was your grandson a quarterback? My grandson was a quarterback. Was that uh, making more unique to you? Or? Uh, it was kind of special. Um, um, he was my second grandson to play, but I, uh, I just found it kind of special. Uh, again, I had mentioned it before, I haven't coached my sons in, in coaching my grandkids. It's just, just something special about having them high. And, uh, and, but again, to win a state title and have your grandson part of that, that made a little bit extra special. That email for you, uh, 1986 baseball team on the state title. And I know it's a different school year, and you come back five, six months later, and the boys soccer team wins the state title. So kind of a bookend to one year, and a book start to the next, I guess. What was that stretch for you like to be on the field for two teams, drastically different sports, but the same? Um, the same achievement goal that they both set out. Well, it's true. Uh, when you talk about soccer, I had made a promise for our athletics at, at that time. Uh, Ted Danko, who was no longer with us, but uh, he was a very good friend of mine, but he's also called an ace and ace. I told him that I would never try to steal a football player to go out and play soccer. And uh, as long as I kept my word, we'd never have a problem. When you 
you sat, it's like a snowball. You sat with a little snow, a little ball, and you keep rolling and rolling, and momentum, the big ball keeps going, and out of nowhere, all of a sudden, you're playing the event for the state championship uh, at, at um, Marlboro, full of field. Keller. Keller, yeah, that's right. Keller, that's important. And uh, we we defeated them two to one under the lights at Mongo for the uh, state championship for that. And that, that was like a needle in the haystack as well. I mean, we won the state championships in baseball, but to have what you consider probably your outstanding athletes all playing football, and yet a bunch of kids that really will give everything they have and go out for soccer and only had a relatively few years of background in it to what youth programs at that time. It was before the youth programs really took over. And for them to do that, it was, I always considered it to be one of the biggest accomplishments uh, athletically in the what, what, Just real quick, what about the baseball, the baseball win for you? Is that your first state title you won? 86, 88, and 96. Right. So that was the first one. What about having the baseball diamond? What did that mean to you? Well, basically, we yeah. actually have a, you dream of winning a state championship. And, and, uh, but if you dwell on that, it's not going to happen. You just go out each day, work, work, work. And again, I like it to a snowball. The uh, things that go on and everything you seem to do goes, goes the right way. You squeeze, you hit and run. And the kids execute it. And that's what you have to have to be able to do that. And for them to do that in, in less than one full year, uh, considering this fall and spring, uh, it was just a phenomenal for the women's high school. Uh, Bob, in 2000, Pioneers won the Division I boys basketball state title. Um, I think it was Holyoke in the semifinals that I looked up, and uh, Boston English in the state final. What I remember about that run was WPI, 4,000 people there in the game, 2,000 people waiting in line 90 minutes before they get in the see St. John's only game meet for the third time that year. Fantastic game, comes down to the end. Uh, just what are your recollections of that game? Uh, just first, I'd be remiss. You know, there's one person who probably should be up here. If you're talking legends, you got Ann Ash Valeski there. That's won a few state titles and an awful lot of games. And I learned an awful lot from her. I always try to learn from whoever I can. Uh, 2000, the last Division I state championship in the Central Mass was Holy Name with Marvin Sapin in 1973. So in 27 years, all we heard was Boston, Boston, and geez, that, that Holy Name game was just something else. They had Neil Singleton at 7 6. And I had Timmy Delaney, who some of you know. And Timmy said, I'm going to go to the free throw line at the end of the game. And I'm going to put in two free throws to win the game. So, okay, Timmy, <laughs> put whatever, 15 seconds to go. Timmy gets the ball, goes right at Neil Singleton, gets fouled, steps to the line. There is a goal for up one. You got Jerry Frew out here. Uh, I don't want to tell about his son. Uh, you know, it's probably one of the most interesting stories. Uh, they had McLean kid as the point guy, and uh, Jerry's son, David, was a good defensive player. So I sent him into the game, and I said, you get McLean. And he says, okay, I got him, I got him. He goes into the game. Here comes McLean up the court. There's David, got the guy over there. <laughs> and he's looking aside of him, so he figures it out. I'm not guiding him. So now McLean's still coming. David goes from that wing and goes over to this wing here. That's got the guy on that side. And I go, oh my God, we're in trouble. Now, meanwhile, McLean gets so confused by what's happening, he gets to the free throw line and doesn't know what to do. So he shoots it and misses. And as he misses, Neil Fingleton at 7 6 is over the rim with the ball like this. And he goes to jam it through. And one of his own players hit him from the side. 
and he and a bounder off the rim, and then it went out to the Moore kid, who was a great player, and he panics a little bit and just throws it up there, and we went by one. <laughs> so people will say, oh, you're a skilled coach, and you go, yeah, how about some luck there? So, yeah, that year was outstanding, and, you know, I got the LeBeau brothers here, and they took me to the state finals. I think I went, or well, Richard Rogers was the year with them, and we went to the state finals four years in a row, and that was just really, so it's been, I think, unheard of in the state of Massachusetts for that to happen, but I had real good players, and they were good. In 2009, we won that state championship, too. So, yeah, it's a big thrill. In fact, they just got their rings this past winter, because in St. John's, we don't do that. They went out and bought them on their own. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> so championship is something else. Okay. So uh, I'm curious just about uh, something, forget it, we can't any more touch on it, but just um, what do you, people study you because of the success you guys have had. Um, how do you, what do you, do you still take things from other coaches? Do you study these young guys and maybe pluck something or ask them something that you see or is it just, I'm just curious about how much you um, are still maybe a pupil as much as a teacher when it comes to coaching. The day I start being a pupil is the day that I retire. If you see me at any game, people laugh. It's in my pocket. I always carry somewhere here a midget pencil. <laughs> okay, and any game I go to, I copy things down. Girls game, boys game, girls field hockey game, Celtics game, the uh, Patriots, things they do. And I think you learn, and the day you stop learning is the day someone's sitting out there waiting to beat you. So yeah, I think you gotta keep learning if you wanna hopefully be good. So we go like, you wanna follow up on that? I'm gonna give you a different one. Well, I, uh, I agree with that. They, if, you know, if you, you have to, you have to do what, what you have to do, and, and trying to do something that's out of the ordinary is not going to work. And uh, the tighter the game gets, the more that if you work on these things, there's no problem. Kids can adjust because you've gone over this. If you don't book cover these things, then when you get down to nitty gritty. Usually going to be on the losing side. What about a, what about a student would have like a player says, hey, maybe we should try this. Let's see if they can run or something. Oh, what? Like a player would say, hey, let's try to hit and run when you get a coach. Yeah. Would that ever happen? Or is it? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Nice try. Okay. Okay. Again, all I can like you guys play once a week, you guys don't, but it's, again, there's so much game playing involved in your end. And is it? You know, you have your system that you do, and again, for so long it was distinct, and now like you said, everyone's passing and that type of deal, but what about being able to, things you can point at and say, oh yeah, I fucked this from somebody. You know? I steal from anybody, yeah. and everybody, <laughs> and um, I'll watch any game, I watch high school games that are on ESPN now, uh, college pros, and I got a pad, and I got a pencil, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm constantly looking to see what I can steal. And uh, people don't have to steal from me. They can just ask me and I will, I will give them anything. It does not make any difference whatsoever. And uh, as far as kids, I love when my kids give me suggestions. We just had one this past week and we had a variation of it. We didn't try it, but I'm all up for my kids. Uh, uh, you know, giving me suggestions, I'll listen to anything. And uh, there were times, matter of fact, my, my sophomore quarterback, I told him early in the week, come up with the first play. So <laughs> I'll, I'll listen to anybody. I, I don't know everything, so I'm willing to take whatever I can. So this is a classic question um, that all educators hear. Um, I'm going to keep my things myself for right now, but I'm just curious. Hey, during the course of time, kids change? They're the same as when you say it. Or if they. Well, uh, you, you know, you could probably ask me that question one week and then ask me the next week and it might change even with me. I think uh, in terms of your athletes playing the game, they're a lot alike. 
what has changed is what's happening outside of, of, of the football itself. Uh, right now, the social media part is, is extremely big. But over the years, I, I, I found that players are consistent. You win with players who want to be with you, who want to play your game. And we're finding that right now. The kids out there are there because they want to. And, and I think that's what's consistent over the years. And it's just a little bit of the outside influence that might affect them. Uh, the one thing I've noticed with kids nowadays, and, and it, it, this does bug me very much, if I'm going, to, I was here at 5.30, and we sat up and I thought, I just believe in being there early. And uh, sometimes I think what we're doing, and I'm not gonna just say football, I just think generally the high school kids, uh, they just don't have that same concern for being on time. And that frustrates me sometimes. And so that has changed a little bit. But as far as the game itself and, and the players, uh, the fact that they want to be there is very important. And, and that's what we appreciate. Well, do you know, did you notice kids changing? Or, or in a so in what way? Like from the beginning to the end? Well, actually, uh, the coach's reputation precedes him. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, uh, most of the time, uh, kids, I can't play for Johnson, I'll go to uh, St. Burns, you know, that, that type of situation. But you're, you're real athletic type of kids that really want to play and play at a high level. Uh, you never have a problem with uh, If there's a problem, I, and I'm coaching and going on a thing, I'll say, don't discuss if you have a problem now, but after the game or after the practice, I will be here, come over, and we'll talk and see if we can get things straight if something's bothering you or you misinterpreted what I'm trying to talk about. But uh, overall, I, I found the kids to be great. I, I really did. Very, very few uh, negative things occurred. Yeah. And, and believe me, we were <laughs> in deep waters a lot of different times. You know? uh, as you're looking at kids, I guess that's why I coach. I love kids. Love coaching them and seeing how they act, their attitude, and all that. And I don't see any difference. The kids I have, if they come from good parents, which I've been very lucky with that, I don't see them being any different than that guy there. All right? He was a player while I was coaching. Uh, I coached, uh, I wouldn't say things basketball, I was the assistant coach in football and I also coached baseball and my teams played against him and he was a competitor when he played and when I went to St. John's they said, well, you go there, there aren't any tough kids, they were all rich kids. I said, there's a thousand boys, I'm going to find some tough kids. So the question is, you're going to play tough kids. And uh, there's a lot of fancy kids out there, but tough kids weren't being for you. Uh, just, just a couple of things there, you know. I guess when you look back on the years, it's the kids that have played for you that are something special. Every St. John's game, I have two kids from Uxbridge that graduated in 1967 or whatever, Carl Ashcraft and Mike Kroll, and they come to every one of my games. And so I'll turn and say, well, oh, there's a couple of my kids up there, and my kids are 72 years old. <laughs> you you got to figure, the kids who played for me, I was 21, they were 18, so they're 75 years old today. But to me, they're still my kids. And I still remember my wife there. Uh, I think it was one of our first dates, and I said, I'm gonna bring you down uh, to one of our games and you can meet my kids. And she went, oh my God, he's married. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's my kids who play for me. And in fact, one quick one there, we were down Blackstone River or something, one of those new things down there where you walk along the edge. And way back, right by Uxbridge, and I said, take me over to the old high school. And she said, why? I said, just take me there. I walked out on the baseball field, 
And I sat there and named every kid who played for me on that team there by position in 1969. And I guess that's what, what it's all about. You say, why do you keep coaching? Because kids are great and they just keep coming back and it's something special. So you just stole my next question <laughs> about why you keep coaching. So we, I'm gonna ask you though, uh, <laughs> you, you stopped once in high school um, and then you came back after three years and then you retired uh, a few years ago. If you don't know, he has been working with Worcester State baseball team since uh, sometime around maybe 2017, 2018, three years. So, uh, so you retired but you keep coming back. So why is that? I love to coach kids, to be truthful. Uh, the first part of the question you asked me was, what is your, your, you've essentially retired twice in coaching. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you, and you came back twice. You see, I was a fanatic. I went from soccer to bas JV basketball to baseball to coaching American Legion baseball in the summer. So. Uh, at that time, my wife was very lenient with me <laughs> because I was home too long. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, uh, it, it wore on you after a time. And as a result, uh, it took me quite a while to realize that I had something to push away. So I took a couple of years away from coaching and uh, got, got things back in order as far as my mindset and decided I just wanted to coach if I had the opportunity again of soccer and baseball. And uh, as it turned out, one of the baseball coaches left at that time and I was able to take that over in the soccer program. Uh, I, was, I had coached there before when he was a temporary coach there. And it, so it worked out. Uh, but uh, it's, it, it's demanding, especially if you go year round. And that, that, when you're young, you, I, I, I guess you can do that. But some, even then, sometimes you get worn down, and, and, and it's, it's tough. A couple of sports, especially if it goes fall and then spring, it makes it a little bit easier. You did it for 43 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It wasn't too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, I'm just curious, again, I guess I'm both the same thing. Um, for that for a long time, um, done teaching now, but still coaching. Um, kind of the same thing in a way, teaching and coaching, but outside the school, instead of him. But why keep showing up for um, July until hopefully the summer of the year? Well, I guess we all share the same thing. We enjoy the kids we have. Uh, we love the sport, and we love what it, it provides. And, and it does, it provides, uh, uh, I can tell you there are many kids who I know they've graduated because of football at Northbridge. And how many does it make it to be important? Maybe two, five, I don't know how many. And when you realize uh, how important it is to the kids, how important it was to me when I was in high school. It's the one thing I, I, I probably, I felt I was good at, I don't know if I was, but there was such a confidence uh, booster when you were young. And I see it happening with the kids now. And again, uh, I, I get the hook is out there. I, I've got my grandkids coming through. Uh, that's fun. Uh, we're still doing a, a certain amount of winning. And let's face it, winning is fun. And so uh, when you can combine all those, it, it, and then before you know it, I, I think all of us would say the same thing. Where the heck did 50 years go? You don't start your first coaching assignment saying, I'm gonna be doing this for 50, 55 years or something like that. It just happens and then it happens because it's fun and you know, there's a certain amount of success that goes along with that, but uh, it just continues to be fun. And I'll know when I'm finished when I don't want to go to practice. To me, practice is the best time. That's why I love going to practice. What is it? What is it about practice that you enjoy? Oh, it's 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 just fun. I, I, I love to call plays. I like to create plays, and we have that opportunity all the time. Um, it's just it, it's the teaching. It's the teaching process that that's important. It, this is when you win or lose games. It's, it's the practices. Uh, that you hope you, you you give them what they need for that Saturday or Friday night game to, to make it happen. 
Yeah, but like I said before, math isn't my strong suit, but I'm remembering now I said something, you would go to on it with a flat before a game this year, right? Northridge. It's 50, 50 years of coaching at Northridge football. Six, I six in, in, as assistant in 44. Yes. As head coach. So it's my 50th year on, on and it's ironic this this Friday will be technically the last um, game on a uh, grass field because we're getting new turf and we're very excited about that. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was a uh, plaque for 50 years. And uh, one thing about me is I probably could have only been coached at Northbridge. I, I don't know if I would have had any other confidence to go anywhere <laughs> else to coach. Um, but uh, yeah, time flies. I'm just going to do a final round here and get a couple questions in. No doubt. Do you, What's changed about the game that you're at the high school level? Like what's changed about football over the course of your time? Just the style of play. Um, what has happened is a lot of these other schools have caught up to us. Again, we were the ones, uh, one of the few, throwing the ball a lot and throwing it at strange times. Now everyone is doing that. So that's what's changed for me. Now uh, I used to feel that my offense could dictate what the defense would play. I could dictate what they would uh, show against us. Now they're throwing some twists at me. They're not doing what I expect them to do. So uh, you got to be a little more imaginative. But uh, that's how, that's how it is for us. Well, in soccer, you know, years ago, we started with, I believe it was it was called the Southern Worcester County League, which was more or less kind of that area. Uh, because high school teams just didn't have soccer to start with. And so uh, uh, you had the advantage of but just having them in great shape did a, a wonders for your team because the skills would gradually come as you play the game. You just don't all of a sudden have skills unless someone was born with those and that, that's few and far between. Uh, in, in baseball, uh, you, you, I would say that the trend has not changed. Uh, baseball, kids that love baseball will work at their trade. They will work at it. They, they want to get better and excel. Uh, where, where the difference is, as soon as they meet a, a pitcher on a different level, now it kind of separates the boys from the men. But they have to make adjustments. And, and when they make adjustments, all of a sudden now, whether it's choking up a little bit or trying to hit the ball the opposite way to see it a little bit longer, uh, those things are made, and now they can have success in doing those type of things. What about the, the pitching at the end? Just follow like, over the course of the time pitching. Is it, um, you find it more refined at the end, the pitchers being maybe ahead of, them, ahead of where they would have been 25 years ago in terms of their well, and and I wouldn't say that. When we faced Ron Dow and Mark DeBerg and Fidrich, and, and they were playing against us, if you weren't at your top of your game, you had no chance. Uh, the, but uh, that's true. Perhaps, overall, uh, younger kids get better coaching now than they did. Not because uh, no one wanted to, but because they didn't have the expertise to go into those areas uh, to be able to do that. Bob, I don't for basketball is obviously just a fundamental change with the three-point lines altered the game somewhat. Um, but you know, I, I go to games and hear people say, oh, kids can't shoot anymore. They used to shoot better. So but do you, what do you see in the skill level of players today versus what you would have coached in the 70s? Uh, I don't know. I, I guess I'd answer that. The way I coach, I haven't changed. <laughs> the same things we did in 1963, I'm doing. The three-point shot did come in, and so many teams are shooting the three. I still play two guys down in the pivot, like Parrish and McHale. We take it to the hole. Uh, not that we don't shoot the three. You've been at my games. I have kids that can shoot bad, and we look at that as being a positive thing because if I shoot a few threes and put them in, then you can't drop down on my big guys. So these new rules come in and you have to be ready to take advantage of them. But uh, for me, the game just, I love the old game and so far it's helped me win.
Hey, can I just throw something in there? Sure. People talk about wins with the three of us, and obviously the three of us have won a lot of games. Well, Dan, we lost some games. Yes, we did. When I was at Uxbridge, I lost games. Uh, I coached 1,289 high school basketball games. So it's somewhere around 300 losses. And those kids at Uxbridge lived and died for me out there. And we'd be ahead, we'd be ahead, and finally talent would win out in the end and we'd lose. So every game means something to me, not just the ones you win. What's the, uh, for lack of a better term, what's the hardest game you ever lost? Is it one that sticks out to you and says, that, you know, <laughs> you don't want to remember. You don't want to remember. I lost. You don't want to remember those games when, where it happened in the last second, or the last bat it hits a ball. But uh, you know, over the course of years, there's a lot of uh, heartbreaking and going home unhappy. But uh, that's the nature of the game. And tomorrow, the sun's going to come up, and we're going to regroup and go from there. One of the best parts of getting older is you forget things. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, yeah, I forgot a lot of those losses. I'll give that shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah tough, toughest one for me, probably, although very good, as some of you know, for the game. When I lose a game, I put it behind me and go on. But we were in the state finals. Uh, we played at, you know, that was Lawrence Central Catholic. And they had really beat us bad in the scrimmage. And we played them in the state finals. And we're down one. Uh, actually, we were up one, I'm sorry, with maybe 11 seconds to go. And I got Richard Rogers, the Green Bay Packers and the Eagles or whatever. He's on the line. He's got two shots. He puts them in, I win. This is the first, this is the second. Their kid throws a jumper at the buzzer and they beat me by a point. It isn't that the loss is tough, but I went down to the locker room and grabbed him by the shirt, which you're not supposed to do, and said, Richard, if the thought of you ever missing those two free throws ever comes to your mind when you're playing in college or pros, I'm going to find you and I'm going to punch you in the nose. You got that? <laughs> you better forget it. It's behind us now. So that was one of my toughest ones. You won't believe this, but the one that I think about the most wasn't in football. I had a, my one of my daughters, Kylie, played uh, softball for me, and I had two outstanding teams, not because I was a good coach, because they, I had two fathers who taught their daughters how to pitch. And so, but we were 20, 23 and over, and we lost the state final. And that one seems to come to mind more than any football game I have, because uh, nothing's worse than to be undefeated through the whole year and not win at all. And uh, that one's the one that sticks in my mind. It's not even football. So uh, that's, I feel like that's a good spot to wrap it, unless you want to. Well, I'll leave, I'll leave it. So there's a lot of family and friends here, so I'm going to put it out this way. This is your chance to ask things you've never asked them before <laughs> or been afraid to. Um, if we want to take a few questions from the audience, um, if we don't, then we can just wrap it up here. So. Questions? Hi, my name is Jessica. I was um, wondering what you guys thought, um, what advice you would have for parents with kids in the youth programs. Um, I read a lot of things about doing a variety of different sports, don't letting kids just do one sport year round, giving them breaks, um, that kind of thing. And I just want to know what kind of advice you would have for parents of student athletes. I'll start with that one. That's uh, one of my favorite topics. I think in many ways we are starting on kids uh, organized too young. I've always felt that way. Uh, I'm disappointed when I don't see a lot of yard play. And I think that's one thing I, I love. If you come to my to my house, 
um, we have a little field there and we'll see uh, kids playing all the time. And I just don't feel there's enough playground play. I think that's when they, they become imaginative. They learn to settle their own issues. And, and uh, I think, you know, getting to that seventh, eighth grade in my sport, I'd be content if they didn't start till, till eighth grade officially. And um, as far as playing multiple sports, uh, I've always encouraged my athletes to play other sports. I do not need them to concentrate on football 12 months a year. I do not need that. What I need for them is to come back as a better athlete. And you become a better athlete by playing uh, baseball, lacrosse now, uh, wrestle. Just uh, summer basketball does not make any difference to me. You come back as a better athlete and we'll take over from there. So. Uh, too much, too organized, and, and, and I do not like it when a player concentrates on one sport. I just think it's important to play two or three sports, be an athlete. I totally agree with that. Uh, one sport athletes, uh, they'll be much better in that sport that is their favorite if they play the other sports because they're developing other parts of their body which are gonna make them just a better player overall. I agree with everything that Kenny said and Emil said. Uh, I couldn't have said it any better. I played three sports in high school, lived every second, loved every second of it, coached three sports in high school. And at Oxbridge at the time, I had the same kids for all three sports, so you really get to know them well. And the other thing Kenny touched on is you know, playing three on three ball and down at the park, one on one, two on two, everything is organized. Unfortunately, you're stuck as a parent that kids aren't playing at the fields. They're not playing pickup games. And, you know, a kid will come to me and say, Should I play AAU? I say, The best thing you can do is get your friends, go down to the park and play three on three. But I think our kids are so structured today that parents have to tell them everything, what to do with a coach, so kids can't learn things on their own. And my thing there was always, you want to get good, find a kid who's better than you, figure out how he beat you, and, and, and do what he did, and, and get better than him, so. Any other questions? So, uh, so just in closing, uh, like I said, I've always wanted to bring these three guys together uh, to talk about the wins and the losses. Um, you know, and, you know, I just think it's a this is a, a good chance to recognize both in person and, like I said, with the social media going out, uh, three tremendous coaches had influence on. Literally, I was trying to do the math today, and it, I mean, combined, it's got to be over ten thousand kids or something like that. It, it's in the five figures. And, that's just, you know, and, and get into it where people in the classroom touching kids that way is outside of sport. So this is just a great opportunity and I just, I just want to thank Ken, Emil, and Bob for coming out tonight on a Monday and uh, giving up their time to share their story with you and, and everybody who will be watching this uh, online and, and YouTube and all that other stuff. So again, uh, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.